Shalom. I'm Doug, and I'm here again with Dr. Dustin Barlett, and we want to encourage you in the study of the biblical languages. Dr. Dustin Barlett, thanks for joining us for another episode of Studying the Biblical Languages. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was great to have you on last time and for our audience to get an introduction to you and to your work in the flood account, your thoughts on uh, the scholarship there and, and using different methods, uh, particularly uh, rhetorical criticism to study the Hebrew Bible. And today I appreciate you uh, joining us once again and I want to uh, continue the conversation. And um, you, you did your dissertation, uh, the Judgment and, and Salvation, that uh, rhetorical uh, critical analysis of the flood account, but that's not all you're interested in. You've done research in other parts of the Bible. You've uh, written other articles, uh, uh, other topics, and so forth. Would you, would you like to share just some of the other research uh, and projects you've been involved in? Absolutely. So some of the, my uh, academic articles, because I write some general, I write some general articles for uh, the people in the pew. It isn't just the ivory tower, and I like to help put the cookies on the shelf where the kids can get them. I want to create accessible resources for others so that way everybody can be able to uh, benefit from the teachings and some of the training that I've had. But my more recent articles, I published an article in a hyperbole, actually. So this one was published with uh, Torch Trinity Journal, and it's actually on a hyperbole in the book of Zephaniah and Genesis and creation and Genesis and the flood. And I wanted to call it, was everybody really kung fu fighting? Because one of the big questions is, of course, with hyperbole is, um, it, uh, it's often the case that people want to dismiss or mitigate the flood or the dimensions of Noah's Ark with hyperbole. And so I've been down the rabbit hole, um, I've got this article published, I've got another one in queue, I've got another one also in queue, uh, trying to better understand the method for hyperbole, because what I've been discovering is there's a lot of people who make the assertion, and it's fine to make the assertion, it's different than an assumption, but they make the assertion, oh, the flood is just hyperbole. But I was reading Bruce Waltke's uh, Genesis commentary, and he says, even allowing for oriental hyperbole and then he goes on about how the scribe has in mind a universal flood. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to better understand the method behind uh, hyperbole and to try to help perhaps temper some of that language. Or if you're going to assert that it's hyperbole, let's at least back it up with some evidence. And so even things as interesting as the book of James says, see what large ships, and then it talks about such small rudders. Well, there's no adjectival qualities to the dimensions of Noah's Ark. It's not the biggest, it's not the fastest, it's not the strongest. And unlike other parts of Scripture, it's not even a little boat. But we have things such as the ships of Tarshish. And then it talks about other adjectival qualities. There's no adjectival qualities or great ability to the dimensions of Noah's Ark. So to claim it's hyperbole without any actual great ability or adjectival qualities that's interesting to me. And so I'm leaning into that more. That's more my more recent articles. I'm also, uh, I've finished an article on the Masoretic accents, and it related to the stars. I was listening to this one particular song, and it kept talking about how the Lord holds the stars in his hands. And because he holds those stars in the hands, see the way that he can hold our hearts. And that goes all the way back to Jesus' words about how he sees the sparrows fall. But as I was engaging with the literature, what I began to discover is that a lot of individuals try to marginalize the role of the stars as if he made the stars also. And there's a lot of validity to the fact that for God, despite the astronomical number of stars, astro despite the astronomical number of stars, um, despite the high number of stars that actually do exist, they were a mere trifle for him. But I became increasingly persuaded that that actually was not the focus of the text. The focus of the text was actually trying to say that the moon with the stars are co-rulers together. And that was based upon the accentual pointing. And then in another article that I'm writing also pertains to the accentual pointing. And it dovetails more with exegetical fallacies. And it has to do with what was Adam doing, Adam doing in the garden. Was he placed there? Or was he caused to rest there? And that the difference is with the Masoretic pointing of a particular verb there. 
Well, that's great that you bring this in uh, to help us understand the, the phrases, the, the clauses, the groupings, the words here, right? That's, that's part of what's helping to understand both of those passages. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, interestingly enough, I teach Hebrew, and uh, not every instructor does this, but we actually require all of our students to read Potato's book on the basics of, uh, you know, on the accents. And we actually do go through one of my articles, and we actually do go through some examples. And I feel that that's such a good tool, pedagogically speaking, to help come alongside students to position them for success. It took me a very, well, actually a frustratingly long time to gain facility with the accents. And now that there's these new tools available and different yeah. resources, I say let's lean into them and give it all we got. Absolutely. No, no excuse to, to ignore them now. When I went through my programs, it uh, wasn't something that, that I was able to get a lot of instruction in at first. Then uh, I had Dr. Steve Boyd as, as my last uh, official formal Hebrew instructor, and he had us uh, learn the most common ones. And he was always very encouraging to me when I'd want to pursue some line of investigation um, with the accents there. And, and I find it interesting, too, on, on this channel, which is only at the time of this recording, has only been around about six months or so, the most viewed video on this channel is one about uh, teaching with the Te'amim, about Masoretic accents and uh, fostering fluency for, for reading Biblical Hebrew. And I never would have imagined of all the videos that we put out, I would have thought something on Greek would have been the most popular or something. But what do you know, the you know, people? It's interesting, Doug, because our mutual friend, uh, Dr. Bill Barrett, Actually, his resources were one of the first tools that helped me actually be able to get a firm grasp on the accents. And yeah. you're right. I think that there's actual, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I'm thankful to hear about the success of your channel. The, those accents, yeah, yeah, just blew me away with uh, how popular. But I guess some people, maybe they're like us, you know, and, and more of us than we realize that are actually hungry for it. And sometimes I don't think we give people enough credit. We say, well, that's that's too hard for them to learn, or we'll just skip over that. Or is that no terror? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when some of us are like, what are these cool things? <laughs> Well, very you know, good. I actually feel that that dovetails, like pedagogically speaking, I feel textbooks are so important. And the choice of textbooks that the instructors use, I feel is one of the first lines of offense, or maybe it's defense, I can't remember, but the first lines of success for students. If you don't assign it as a textbook, and you, you, you really are, you're, you're making a statement through the minimization of the resources that you choose to leverage or not leverage. Absolutely. Well, speaking of teaching and uh, textbooks and so forth, I wanted to ask you what were some further thoughts you had about teaching Hebrew, about pedagogy, about resources and so forth. You know, if you're teaching a Hebrew class, what are students going to be using with uh, Dr. Dustin Burlett? Well, uh, I actually... I don't think I'm the best person to be talking to about that. And I recognize that this is the interview, but the truth is I find that when it comes to uh, teaching, I believe very strongly that you must learn to do by doing. But learning to do by doing requires, it's like Miss Frizzle from the PBS series in Magic School Bus. You gotta get dirty. And she has that phrase. Are you familiar with the phrase? What phrase does she have? My kids have watched this, but I don't remember. Well, that. that's a problem. I phrase. can't quite remember it. But yeah. basically, more or less, it's don't be afraid to make mistakes. Make mistakes, get messy. And I feel that that's really where the joy comes from. So what I often do is I like to help students guarantee that you will make it through this class. I am here to position you for success. Let's not worry about the grades. Let's not worry about these things. Let's worry on are you actually grasping this? And do you have a handle on it? And I remember I was teaching word studies at a particular institution, and I had been spending a disproportionately high amount of time on it. I think that we had actually spent upwards of two weeks, perhaps even three weeks, and a particularly, uh, I'm not sure entirely how to describe that student, but it was one of my favorite students spoke up, and they said, Dustin, I have a question. And I said, oh, what is it? And they said, well... I'm not sure if I'm fully tracking with what you're saying. And then I said, okay, which part? And then they took a deep breath. They looked me in the eye and I said, you know, I'm not sure if I know any of it. And we had to just take that moment, absorb that, 
and I started right back from ground zero because it's not important. You don't teach subjects. You teach students. And your whole position is not to cover the material or to cover the content. It's to make, if the students aren't learning, you are not teaching. So I just stopped, and I believe very firmly that spaced repetition is the best form of learning. So we went right back to ground zero, and boom, they did that assignment, and they aced it. But it took that time and that awareness and the sensitivity that, okay, if you're struggling, I'm sure that there's others, but I am here to serve you. That is the whole function and purpose of being an instructor, is to serve and to give other people the leg up. Absolutely. Now that reminds me, you wrote an article on pedagogy for Logos website, didn't that's you? That's correct. And, yeah. Uh, and so, Didacticus. Yeah, that's right. Theodidacitas. That's actually right. And so in that particular article, it was on self-directed learning. And so it's interesting because I have a lot of conversations with my academic deans and even sometimes with my colleagues because all my syllabi have to get approved ahead of time. But I believe very firmly in what's called you pick projects. And so, for instance, uh, in my Ruth class that I'm teaching, I have 10 options that students can take. And that way, there's a sense of buy-in and a sense of ownership. And that way, you can go in this direction, you can go in this direction. But what it also does is it helps students, or at least I believe that it helps students have an awareness and an understanding of these are the multi-dimensional ways that the text can be understood and appreciated. And if you ever leave the classroom, how do you continue your learning beyond the classroom? It opens up, I believe, doorways in the mind to see new avenues and ways of exploring. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful exercise. I grew up where more or less there was constraints put upon you in the syllabi. This is your research paper. You have this amount of pages to read. It was very cut and dry. You'd take some from column A and some from column B. But I actually took advanced teaching skills. And in some of my classes, my original degree was actually in, in education. And I had to develop not only my own syllabi, I actually had to develop my own uh, assignments within that syllabi. And it just gave me a whole new appreciation and love for self-directed learning and that sense of ownership within the classroom. And I've never looked back. And some of my favorite projects as a student were what were called creative projects, where you can actually bring in some of the arts or some of the hands-on components. And so we had people, and at Miller College of the Bible, there's an entire cabinet display of people who have developed uh, different metallurgy works. So they actually made spears. Uh, we've had people who have actually designed trebuchets and chariots, all these different hands-on and uh, we've had a lot of students actually design replicas of the ark, for instance, or different ways to try to bring that. And these creative projects, they're so, so handy. So you can talk about, you know, all the different ways that the buoyancy of the ark, the dimensions of the ark actually help it create stability. But then when you actually build an ark and then you float it in a tub and you can see it for real life, it just creates an entirely new ways of understanding and appreciation of the text. So I'm a firm believer in elements of self-directed learning, and in particular, these creative projects that incorporate new ways of learning and appreciation. We have so many musically talented individuals at our school. A lot of people are involved in camp ministry as well, or they serve in different worship teams, and the songs that they will create and the different lyrics that they produce, it is so phenomenal. If we can just help people to unleash some of their talents, it will often surprise you as an instructor. And I feel all too often what happens is, you know, we, we pigeonhole and we profile and we say, this is what it means to be smart, SMRT. And we don't allow people to express all the different dimensions of how God created them. And I actually disagree with, like, I'm going to mention a lot of children's shows I recognize. And it's mostly because I have younger children. But in Monsters University, when Dean Hardscrabble talks about how it's not my job to make mediocre students less mediocre, but make great students greater, I believe very firmly that there's something not quite right about that philosophy of teaching because I believe that the whole function and purpose of teaching is um, don't just grade my paper, but show me how to get an A. And so that's the whole point. And it's like, if you were bowling and you couldn't see the pins, how could you ever knock them down? 
And so I believe very firmly you set up the pin so the students can knock them down. And that's where the joy is. And there's nothing that breeds confidence like success. That's really neat. Your students are really fortunate to, to have you with the, <laughs> that kind of mindset there. I remember in my undergrad days, uh, one of my professors that uh, gave us pretty wide berth in our history class for our, our you know, well, we did have to write a, a traditional research paper, but I remember even in that, just being able to choose something that was different from what everybody else was doing, but still within the context of the course, it stuck with me. And to this day, I still remember doing research on William Tyndale and Little did I know I'd want to go and study the biblical languages later, uh, for example. So, very good. Um, well, moving from maybe teaching in a, a setting where, you know, you're introducing people to the biblical languages or maybe leading them into an exegesis course and so forth, do you have some thoughts on advanced study and, and how you might encourage further research using the biblical languages and, and just, just what you would say to budding scholars or, or people trying to continue in scholarship? Absolutely. I actually have a few different thoughts to go there. The one is make sure that you use the highest quality tools available. So I see that you and I both have Gesenius's, uh Hebrew lexicon on our shelves. And one of the things that I appreciate is that it also helps you to develop your German skills as well. So I actually have a couple of commentaries on Genesis in German. And I feel that it's also important that you don't just become, uh, you got to learn how to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. And don't be afraid. You got to sit in the soup and allow it to steep and to season. And I feel that it's very important to use as high quality tools as possible and is available to you. Never chintz out on your tools. My dad is a mechanic and I'm telling you, if you use poor quality tools, you're going to end up paying for it later, sooner than later. So never chintz out on your tools. They're, they're your trade. Invest in your library invest in your resources, but also never let a resource bully you. It's all too often the case that, you know, you read something in a commentary, let's say, and what happens is, oh, well, who am I to disagree with XYZ scholar? No. Who are you? You're an individual filled with the Spirit of God who guides you into all truth. So the Word of God is illuminated by means of His Spirit, and you have the power and the authority through your training to challenge the status quo and to continue to dig in and see where the evidence leads. So never let a commentary bully you. But more importantly than that, I believe it's important to be curious. So I was reading Trent Prolonman's Genesis commentary, and it started to talk about the impassibility of God with respect to Genesis 6, and what it did to pain God's heart to see the events unfolding with the Hamas of God's creation, all of the violence. And I began to really begin to analyze and and lean into that. And I came to the conclusion that metaphorically speaking, and it was actually the impetus of my first article, the flood, metaphorically speaking, was the tears of God. Because that particular phraseology of where it pained God to its heart is only ever used within the book of Genesis for the rape of Dinah. And there it states explicitly that the brothers were not only indignant and offended, but angry. And the scribe, through the, God, through the providence of God, actually excludes the angry component that had that collocation. And so it's highly significant that there's a precedent within the Genesis text for anger to be within, and it's only used twice within all of Genesis, and it avoids the use of anger. Rather, it, it, it was a, a feeling of remorse and of pain. And I believe that that has huge significance for our theology of the character of God, because God is not willing that any should perish. And of course, he does not take delight in the death of the wicked. There's great, theo great theological significance there, but it all came through a close reading of somebody else's text and then digging into the lit literature. And I believe that concordance work is often underestimated. One of the first things that I recommend for people is you look it up in a lexicon, read the full entry, and look it up in multiple lexicons, and then go to the concordance and see what the collocations are and see where else this word might occur. And I believe that all too often what happens is people are not looking things up in the lexicon enough and not going to the concordance enough. And then, of course, the grammar. You've got to go to the grammars. And you can't just use the indices. Just because your particular uh, piece of scripture isn't referenced in the indices 
does not mean that your particular grammatical phenomenon does not occur within that literature. So actually, I, I took it upon myself, and not everybody would do this, but I took it upon myself to systematically read the grammars. So I started with Gesenius, and I went on to Waltke and O'Connor, and from there, it just kept going. And as you begin to read grammars from cover to cover, you begin to become immersed in the nomenclature and the categorization, but things will start to pop out for you. And that's one of the things that I appreciate about John Gordon Gay as a scholar. When it comes to references to grammars, I have very rarely found anybody who can give you such exquisite specimens and examples. Another individual is Mark Boda. And so if you want to really see what I mean by this, open up Mark Boda's, uh, either his Nicot commentary on Zechariah or go to his judge's commentary. But look, why is he referencing the grammar? What was so unique and so distinct about this particular phenomenon that he chose to reference it? And one of the highlights for my own uh, studies personally was I found an instance where, and no offense to Mark, Mark is a phenomenal scholar, but I found this one instance where he failed to cite the grammatical support for his, his adjudication, and I mentioned it in my book, and it was like, yes, I found the grammar for this assertion, and it just made my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's a lot of food for thought there on uh, some things that we can do as, as researchers and scholars, Dustin, and uh, that's, I hope folks will take that to heart. There's just so much you've covered here that's helpful for people of all levels. And I, I don't get paid for this, but I also, I want to create a promotion. I have on my shelf here the Dictionary of Classical Hebrew Revised. And I was actually, you mentioned my Logos article. I've actually been invited to write another article for Logos on what's the best Hebrew lexicon. And of course, the answer is just like everything else within Scripture. Context, or it depends, right? For pastors and for most preachers, I love the New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis. The buckets of meaning, the semantic domains, it's such a useful tool. But for most researchers, there is nothing that can be a substitute in the Dictionary of Classical Hebrew, the revised edition. And there's a really good discount going on. If you order, uh, it's not available for institutions. It's only available for persons. And you sign up and every month you pay a certain amount, but they will send you all of the resources at once. And so the Dictionary of Classical Hebrew abbreviated is coming out this month, the revised edition, and I have three issues. But this is one way because when you make that commitment, when you make that investment, you're in it for the long haul and you put your money where your mouth is. Well, for me personally, making that investment was a very important part of me stewarding my resources. Because when you're making this financial contribution, I had to speak with my wife about it. We had to sit down as a family because these resources could be allocated for lots of different things. But we together as a family made the decision, this is important. And it isn't just for my own, uh, you know, uh, people can say, oh, you're trying to toot your own horn. You know, you have a PhD. But for me, PhD stands for a pretty happy dad. Because there's nothing that makes me more happy than to know that I have a relationship with my kids, I have a relationship with my family that's under the umbrella of God's authority. But I'm trying to steward that by being in close alignment with the Word of God. And so one of the ways that I hope to steward that was I, I put my money where my mouth is and I invested in those lexicons. And for me personally, I've never regretted it. Excellent. Well, Dustin, uh, once again, we appreciate you uh, joining us on studying the biblical languages. I'm going to put some links in the description and the companion webpage uh, for our interview where people can find your book, version of your dissertation, and purchase that uh, to check out uh, other articles uh, that you have. And also, there's several other podcast interviews that you can find online where uh, Dustin has been the featured guest. And I would encourage you to check those. Really enjoyed that uh, recent one with the Hebrew Bible Insights. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate you having me back, Doug. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome, and, and thank you also. You've also been a, a constant supporter and encourager uh, on this journey of uh, having these episodes on studying the biblical languages. Folks will uh, see your comments and so forth, and uh, we really appreciate that, Dustin. So thanks again for coming on today. You bet.